Well, hello, ladies and gentlemen. I know you guys were here before waiting for this interview, but there were some technical difficulties. But now they are fine. And so today I have a privilege of another great Vedic astrologer who is actually referred by, you know who, Mr. Juan Paul Manley. And he said, this, you've got to interview this guy. He's one of the you know, great geniuses of Vedic astrology. And after reviewing his website, reading about him, I was just thrilled to bring him on my channel. So please help me welcome the experienced, the great Mr. Mark Boney, Vedic astrologer. How are you, sir? I'm just fine, Kapil. That's quite a build-up. Oh, absolutely. I, hey, I, that's what I like to do. So, Mr. Mark Boney, I wanted to know, how did you get into the world of Vedic astrology? Well, it's a fun story because it's a K. N. Rao story. Oh, wow. Oh, I like that. Yeah, all right. Um, you know, I was friends with David Frawley back in the early 90s, and I had been involved in Western astrology for like 20 years. Oh, wow. Very, very serious student of uh, Western astrology. And, you know, David started organizing the first international symposiums on Vedic astrology. Um, he first, uh, in 1992, he brought Dr. B.B. Raman over. Oh, and, my goodness. And so, you know, he was a very distinguished gentleman, and I loved hearing him speak, but he really didn't demonstrate his skill. He didn't consult, and he didn't teach. And so I actually wasn't really grabbed by it that much, but the next year, um, K. and Rao was the invited chief speaker. And David called me up and says, Mark, you have to you have to meet this person. You know, you'll get a whole different appreciation about Jody. So I agreed to come, and I'm forever indebted to David because it really changed the course of my life. Um, and, and I'll explain what I mean. You know, he gave his talk, and then, you know, surprisingly, he invited people up to his room to just sort of meet with him informally afterwards. Mm -hmm. So I went up in the room, Kapil, and you know everyone had arrived earlier and it was completely packed. The only really space near him was was the only really space in the room left was right up next to him. So it's like the Beatles have shown up. Right. I was convinced. You know, I was you know determined to be involved. So I climbed over these people. They weren't too happy with me, and I ended up sitting down almost right like right in front of him. So he's talking to the group, and at one point he looks at me and says, "Do you know your birth chart?" And I thought he wanted me to hand him my chart, right? So I start to do that, and he says, no, no, please just dictate. So I started just telling him about my chart, my logna and the different positions of the planets. Within seconds after I said that, he said, you are the only male heir of your parents, but have four or five sisters. Oh, my goodness. That, okay, that, that'll floor me. Wow. So, you know, I'm the only male heir of my, my parents, and I have five sisters. Then he, then he said, very good classical education, studied literature. Well, I was blessed to have a very good education. My parents sent me to the best school of money could buy, and I was an English literature major. Oh, you were hooked right there and then. <laughs> then he said something like, nearly married in 1986, but didn't. Exactly right. And bear in mind, he's not even looking at a chart. He's got it in his head. So, you know, I was, I was floored. I was amazed. I'd never seen anything do this. And to make a long story short, the next day he was teaching a class on timing the birth of children. You know, his books, Planets and Children. Right, right. And so I learned those techniques. And when I came back to San Diego where I lived, word had gotten out about this. And I was immediately contacted by a woman who was having trouble getting pregnant. She had done in vitro twice. It hadn't worked. And she wondered if I could tell her when she was going to give birth. Well, I, you know, I told her I was a beginner at this, but I applied all those techniques that I learned, and I made a prediction. Well, amazingly enough, it might have been beginner's luck, but it came out. And so that was my first experience of learning from K.N. Rao, learning his techniques, applying his techniques, and having them work. And then I just, I just got immersed in it. K.N. Rao really liked a group of us in San Diego. He referred to us as his San Diego team. And he started coming here regularly, and it was just a group of like five or six of us, and we would get in someone's home, and he would teach us Jyotish for like 12, 13 hours a day. Oh, my gosh. For like days in a row. And then Bless, I thought, yeah. you know, it was just like an incredibly uh, you know, memorable experience for me. And then he stopped coming to the U.S., and so I went there, spent some extended period of time with him, lived in the complex where he lives there. He took me traveling with him to different pilgrimage sites, which was an extremely special experience. And so I just became, you know, immersed in his 
approach to Jodish, and that was 20 years ago. Well, and ever since then you've been hooked. Well, ever since then I've been completely hooked. <laughs> wow. Now, now it, so was he? Uh, did you start out with learning uh, Gemini or just simple Parashra, and you moved on to Gemini, or you? How did you? Well, you know, he, he, he taught the first course in Germany in 1994 in San Rafael. And I was there with him at that time and was so intrigued by what he said about it. He said that if you wanted to go deeply into the spiritual angle of a birth chart, you needed to learn Germany. And so that statement really intrigued me. And of course, he teaches the composite technique of looking at the chart both from the Parashri angle and from the Germany angle to increase predictive accuracy. And so, you know, ever since 1994, I've adopted that approach and have tried to, you know, uh, be as adept in Germany as I am in Parashri. Ah, interesting. Now, as far as now that we're talking about, you know, Vedic astrology, and I wanted to dig deep in this subject that we spoke earlier about, is the subject of divisional charts, especially Nemansha. We hear all these different uh, stories and scenarios and methods of why certain astrologers use Nemancha. Some don't even use Nemancha. What have you learned, especially you know, being in the presence of Ken Rao? What is Nemancha exactly, and how do you use it? What are some of the like basic methods of just using Nemancha? What is the deeper meaning of that? Well, of course, that's a huge question, Kapil. Yeah. But, you know, I will share with you, I remember one of my first classes with Kane Rao, I heard him quote a statement from South India, something to the effect of, to do astrology without the use, or Jodish, without the use of the Navamsha is an abortion. Rather, wow. a, rather, rather a strong statement, but it makes the point. Yeah. Yeah? And, of course, the most fundamental and basic use of it is to see the strength of planets. Over and over again, you'll you know, like my analogy is, is that you know the the Rashi and the divisional charts are like an iceberg. You've got right. Oh yeah. The Rashi is just sort of the tip of things, just like the tip of the iceberg, but really so much lies in the depth in terms of really appreciating what results the Rashi is going to give, right? So you have so many examples of where a planet is um, apparently fallen or debilitated and therefore weak in the in the Rashi but obtains a very good dignity in the Vamsha and will actually give its results more like that. Uh -huh. you know, the, okay. the perfect example is Barack Obama. Right. As you're probably aware, he became president in the Mahadasha of Jupiter, which Jupiter. Is fall, goes into Capricorn in his birth chart. Yeah. But of course falls in Pisces or its own sign in the Vamsha. Yeah, I see, exactly. Now, K. N. Rao's example is this over and over he used was Indira Gandhi. If you look at her Navamsha, there are four planets that are Vargotama and three in their own sign. So My goodness. This, this gives the overall chart tremendous strength because in Navamsha, the most important divisional chart, those planets have great, great strength. Right. So okay. Some of my favorite examples, if you look at the chart of actress Julie Christie from uh, Dr. Zhivago fame, okay. she has four exalted planets and two in their own sign. She got huge fame and success in her Mercury period, which is actually in Pisces, is debilitation sign, but exalted in Navamsha. I see. So is it is it now here's another thing. Do planets become the Nemansha over time, or is it they're acting like the Nemansha strengths from the beginning? Is it like after maybe twenty eight or Saturn no, return? No, no, no. no I've I've seen no evidence for that idea. Um, it, it they behave like that. You know, from the beginning, look at Serena Williams. At a very young age, she reached the top of the um, tennis world in the period of a debilitated Mars, but exalted in the Lamsha. You'll see this over and over. I could, I could cite, you know, right. <laughs> hundred examples, but that proves the point. So that's just one use of the Lamsha. One use, of, okay. And seeing the strength of planets. Of course, you know, it's the marriage chart. You know, it has to do with uh, looking at the fine detail with regards to our karma. And so, uh, you know, over and over again, I've used the Navamsha chart. You know, you know, people come with this question. When am I going to have a relationship come into my life? Or when am I going to get married? Right. And uh, if you don't use the Navamsha chart with regards to that, it's very difficult to accurately answer that question. Let me just tell you a quick story. A colleague of mine years ago, her husband had left her. She was very distraught over that. She heard I did Vedic astrology and wanted to know if I could give her any input about would she marry again? 
Well, she had a very accurate birth time, and I saw that she was coming up to her moon K2 period. If you looked in the birth chart, they had nothing to do with the seventh house or the seventh lord. You'd never connect them to the experience of, you know, relationship or marriage. But in the Vansha, those two planets fell in her seventh house. Uh huh. And that period and sub period was coming up very soon. And I said, look, you know, if your birth time is very accurate, if we have a correct Navamsha, it looks as if, you know, you're going to be in another relationship, potentially married very soon. Well, she, you know, highly doubted and was skeptical. But as it turns out, shortly thereafter, she connected with an old college friend. They started to, you know, you know, be in touch, visit each other. And to make a long story short, I was invited to her wedding right in Moon Cater. <laughs> oh my goodness! That's and, that, that. And of course, let me for our audience here. What I've found actually is any two planets that are strongly sambanda, that is very connected in the Navamsha, or are one seven from each other, those relationships, those those periods, periods and sub periods can be very fruitful. Let me cite just another sort of classic example. Everybody knows yeah. about Liz, Liz Taylor and Richard Burton, right? Oh yeah. Famous, a famous Hollywood hookup. They were on the mm -hmm. set of Anthony and Cleopatra together. Both were married, but they got very involved, and their relationship was kind of legendary. Yeah. If you look at her chart, you'll see that that happened. I don't, I forget whether it happened in Jupiter, uh, Saturn, or Saturn Jupiter. One of those two. But you'll see that they're in an exchange in the Vamsha. They have nothing to do with the seventh house, seventh lord of either the birth chart or in the Vamsha, but they are strongly sambanda in that chart. You see my point? Uh, so they were on the f first and seventh axis, is what you're saying? No, no, they, they weren't. This is what I'm they saying. They weren't. Okay. They weren't really connected to, but in the Navamsha, they're very connected by the strongest way in which two planets can be connected. Oh, okay. I see. By, by being in a part of Parivartan Yoga. Oh, oh Parivartan Yoga. Okay, now I get it. You know, they're in an exchange. Yeah. And so you'll see that, um, and, and over and over again, I've timed marriage and relationship by, of course, you know, I'm using K and Rao's techniques. Which is not, you know, he talks about if you're only using one dasha, you're rather an impoverished jodashi. He exactly. advocates the use of multiple dashas. Like yogini dasha and chara dasha. Well, particularly chara dasha. So, you know, looking at a chart in the parashari point of view, and then looking at it in the jaini point of view, those are two completely different angles, right? Yeah. With, with completely different timing systems. Of course, you know, in the Jaimini system, we're using the planet with the lowest degrees, the Dharakaraka. So what I'm looking for are periods where these dashes line up. I use the analogy of like a, um, a slot machine. Have you ever been to Vegas, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So course. when you hit the jackpot, all the bananas line up, right? Yeah. So that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for all those periods to line up. I just did it yesterday. I, I consulted with someone, and I asked her if she had a very significant relationship, potentially marriage. At around age 20, 28, it was exactly so. And the reason I was able to identify that is because, you know, she's running periods in Vimshotri, she's running periods in Chara, she's running periods in Yogini, and one additional dasha that I apply, okay. specific just to the Navamsha, a, Jaim, a special Jaimini Navamsha dasha, all of them showed that this period was very relationship giving. Right? So if you can do that retrospectively, of course, you can do that prospectively. But the method is what Sri Rao calls the composite technique. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, absolutely. Where you're seeing things in two very different points of view, using very different timing system, and you're looking for confluence. You know, I'll, I'll give you another quick example. Kapil. Sure. You know, he, he uses um, the AMK, or the planet with the lowest degrees in the Jaimini system. Right. Two time periods of career rise and elevation, right? Because everyone would like to know when they may do particularly well in their activity and their profession, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, by seeing which signs contain the AMK or from where the AMK falls in the 10th house and dialing into those periods using Charadasha, you can actually very quickly identify these periods. AMK, and, you mean Atmakarka? Atmakarka. The one with the highest degree. No, no, no. AMK. Playing yeah. with the second highest degree. Oh, Amatya Karka. Yes, Amatya okay. Karka. Okay, so, okay. Let's, let's be clear. Not the Atmakarka. Atma Amatya Karka. Amatya okay. Karka, playing it with the second highest degree. So in her case, I saw that some while back in 2007, she was running her Scorpio period, which contained her Amatya Karka, her AMK, right? Okay. And so it can be a period when one gets elevated. And, of course, that will happen in a particular sub-period. And then I'm checking in 
Vimshotri. And notice during the same time period she's running, this period and sub period of two planets forming Gajikesri Yoga. Right? It's a fairly good Gajikesri. Right. Yes. And so I'm checking it again in one additional system. And so I said in 2007, it seemed like you were, had a major rise in life. And she said, well, it's, it was exactly so. I was working in a position in a bank, and they offered me a, a position as a head of a branch. Oh, wow. You know, Look at that. A rather substantial promotion, which came with yeah. a large increase as well. So this, this is how K. N. Rao teaches one to, and this is how I, now I teach my students, to pinpoint different periods in the life um, and improve, you might say, predictive accuracy by being able to see it in more than one system. This now, were you uh, specifically uh, the, regarding the Amatya Karka, were you also using the, the Samsha chart, the D10 chart, or just Nemansha and the Lagna? In this case, actually, all I needed to use and all I was using was the Rashi. These things Rashi. can be con these things can be confirmed, however, uh -huh. both in the Nemansha right. and in the Dashamsha. You know, he teaches various Jaimini Raji yogas, ones that you won't actually find in the Jaimini Sutras itself. Oh wow! But I've found them. You might be familiar with his book called Predicting Through Jaimini Chars Dasha. Right? Um, they're all given there, and, and I teach them now in my in my programs, but. I found them to be extremely effective. Wow. Now, I also heard, and, and I once since I started using this method, it was actually very profound, is that you should also use aspect, conjunction, and yogas in all the divisional charts. Yes. Is that, that is, first of all, that is his approach. Yeah. And you know, I always like to joke that my astrology is just a pale imitation of K and Rao's. <laughs> yeah. But absolutely... And I found them to be, if, if understood correctly and if applied correctly, um, I found, yeah. them, found them to be very effective. Absolutely. Kabil, um, you know, there's it's some controversy right. about whether, you know, aspects are to be used. But, you know, I refer people to the Shastra itself. If you go to the Brihat Parashwa or Shastra, in the chapter on Sannyasa Yogas, that is, Yogas that give asceticism, mm -hmm. there is a yoga that Sri Rao taught me that inclines a person to become a spiritual renunciate. It pertains to the Navamsha. Are you familiar with this one? No, not, not that. No. It's, when, it's when the moon is in the sign of Mars okay. and receives the aspect or conjunction of Saturn. Now, the, the, verse, the verse in the Brihat Rasha Horshasa, I've seen it in the original Sanskrit, it uses the word Shani Dristi, which of course means the glance of Saturn. Glance, okay. Well, of course, you don't believe it just because it's in some Sanskrit text. You start testing it, right? Mm -hmm. So you pick up the chart of uh, Paramahamsa Yogananda. His, you'll see in his Navamsha that his moon is in Aries, the sign of Mars, and receives the aspect from Cancer, 10th house aspect of Saturn. If you look in the chart of Ramakrishna Paramahansa, you'll see his moon is also in Aries, receives the aspect of Saturn, this time from Aquarius, third house aspect. If you look in Yogi's Destiny and the Wheel of Time, and he gives there, Sri Rao gives the birth chart of his mantra guru, you'll see that he also has the moon in the sign of Mars, aspected by Saturn. So when you see these things, classical statements, and then you see them coming out in charts, that's what lends credence. Right. So when people say that you don't use aspects in the divisional charts, I can't accept it. Number one, exactly. that's, not, that's not what my teacher taught me, and I haven't found it to be not true. And that's not also what's given in certain classics. Absolutely. Of course, and then the real test is, can you use it to predict? Right? And uh, I feel that I've used the asp. Well, I'll just give you a, a, another quick example here. Sure. I recently, I recently wrote an article about the chart of Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, the great basketball Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, um, you know, he had this... His great fame all coming all came in his Jupiter period, which is configured in a um, uh, really substantial both Raja and Gajakesri yoga. If you look in his Dashamsha, you'll see that it becomes exalted there, and it's in a mutual glance with Mercury. So what I've seen over and over again, when two planets are strongly connected in a something like the Dashamsha, mm -hmm. and there's the promise of great results in the birth chart. Not just the divisional chart, it has to, the promise has to exist in the birth chart as well. But then if it also exists in that divisional chart, 
and that particular planet is, in a, is strongly connected to another, that period and subperiod becomes very significant in terms of giving the results of whatever yoga, good yoga, that the planet's involved in in the birth chart. Was that clear? Did yeah, that clear? absolutely. Actually, that actually takes me to the, my next question, is that many people have Raj Yogas and Dhan Yoga, yet they never come to experience that. They are still saying, I don't have a job, I don't have money, and I'm going through my Mahadasha, which supposedly says it's a Raj Yoga Dasha. What, in your experience, have you learned that why some people who do have Raj Yogas or Dhan Yoga do not get the money and the positions that it promised? Yeah, you don't see the effect in their life. Yeah. That, that's a very important question, and in many ways it's the whole crux of uh, good judgment in Jogesh. Because, you know, we have these yogas, uh, but, you know, the classics are very clear that, you know, they fall in a, a three basic categories. You have yogas that will give sapal, meaning full fruit. You'll have yogas that give mishrapal, that is, you know, partial fruit. Right. And then there'll be yogas that are nishpa, meaning no fruit. And of course, the real skill in Jyotish is to be able to determine whether a yoga will give its full fruit, will only give partial fruit, or whether it won't give any fruit at all. Of course, the key to that, as the, as the Shastra says, is to see that, number one, the strength of the planet, and of course, its overall disposition in terms of favorable or unfavorable conditions as well. Mm -hmm. You know. Let me let me you know speak not just abstractly but through an example. Sure. I, I recently wrote an article about the chart of Jennifer Lawrence, the young actress who. Yeah, yeah, yeah. First of all, she has an amazing Jupiter. It's the Lord of her third house of the dramatic arts. It falls at just the exact degree of uh, the highest degree of exaltation, that is five degrees of Cancer, right? Wow. Yes. And it's involved in multiple. Uh, good yogas. It's a, uh, you know, Hamsa Mahapurush yoga. It's a part of a Lagna Adi yoga. It's in a very good, uh, you know, suna, Shubha Sunatva yoga. And, and I could just go on, so, so on and so on. It's good Raja yoga, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Mm -hmm. So you, I call this the pile on effect. She has a planet that's involved in a number of uh, good fame giving yogas, but then you have to see its overall strength. It's extremely strong in the Rashi, but you'll see that it gets strength also in the divisional charts. And then even more important, it falls in the Lagna of the Dashamsha. Oh, that's, yeah, that's very important. Yeah. So you'll find, I'm sure as you've found, and other students here listening may have found, that when a planet falls in the Lagna of a particular divisional chart, it holds a special potential and promise for bringing the result relative to that particular portfolio of life. But again, only if that promise exists in the birth chart. Of course, you know, divisional charts are not, um, uh, they're, they're derivations of the birth chart and really have no meaning except in relationship to that. And right. of course, the problem with divisional charts, as you well know, is that they're very, se very sensitive to even minute inaccuracies. In the oh, absolutely, chart. yeah. But of course, for that reason, can be utilized to rectify and, and you know, uh, modify time so that, you know, I, I, I see it like a rubric's cube when you know everything sort of clicks in terms of how events are coming out in the divisional charts, you know then you know you can adjust the birth time accordingly in order to you know have it be exactly accurate. Although sometimes you know a very accurately recorded birth time like my own um, gives the correct set of divisional charts right from the get-go. So pretty much like um, as Jennifer Lawrence chart is pretty much what you meant. It's like applying the Shatpala concept to see the overall strengths. Well, you know, it's interesting you can say that. It's, it's easy to miss, but in the in Briyat Parasha or Shastra, after the chapter on Raja Yogas, after the chapter on Dhana Yogas, yeah. if you look, there's a, there's a verse that says, and these yogas should be interpreted based on the overall disposition of the planets and their strength. Then it goes on to talk about Dasa Varga, that is the placement in that division of ten divisional charts. Dasa Varga, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. So the Dasa Varga of the planet in terms of how, how many good divisions good divisions yeah it's, it's obtained in Dasa Varga, particularly four four in particular, um, Rashi, mm -hmm. Navamsha, Drekana, and Shastyamsha. Shastyamsha, okay. So we know that Bill Gates's Venus period brought him enormous wealth. Yeah, it's involved in that Mahalakshmi Yoga, right? 
Yep. And we know that Michael Jordan's Venus period brought him six NBA championships. Yep. If you look at their Venuses, you'll see that it's exalted in the Shastri Yamsha. And you'll see that using Mantraswara's definition of a good division, which would include exalted, which include own sign, Mulatrakona sign, great friend sign, friend sign, if you use that definition and you see how many times a planet falls in one of those divisions in Dasha Varga, that will give you a very good gauge as to how much juice that planet has and how strong its effects it can give in its periods and subperiods. Because, you know, and plus you have to have the Dasha at the right time. I like to joke about my chart, Kapil. I have a very good Dhana Yoga that my Venus is involved in. Uh -huh. But I was born in my Venus Dasha, and, uh -huh. I, and I moved out of that Venus Dasha six months after I was born. Oh, man. Just missed it. <laughs> I, I never get the Mahadasha of Venus. <laughs> Feel sorry for me. This is the tragedy of my life, right? But, yeah. Oh, man. But, of course, I get Venus subperiods, and they've always been very, very good in terms of bringing, uh, you know, a wonderful quality of uh, prosperity and affluence. You know, exactly. Into, into my life. So I remember getting contacted by a woman who used to see all my posts on something on the Jyotish list, and she was feeling very indignant, kind of like the people you're talking about. You know, I supposedly have this wonderful yoga in my life, this Gajikesri yoga that's also a Dhana yoga, but I don't see it in my life. Well, you know, after looking at her chart, I simply wrote back to her and said, yes, you know, you'll never, you're never going to run either of those periods in this lifetime. Exactly. So you, don't, you don't get the full fruit of the yoga. But there's all kinds of reasons that a yoga might not give its full fruit. And obviously we can't cover all of them here, but yeah. it always has to do with the condition and the strength of the planet. Sometimes it also has to do with, you know, of course, in order for yogas to give their greatest effect, you, the Lagna, Lagna Lord has to be strong. Strong, yeah. You know, the classics uh, emphasize this, you know, over and over again. Yeah, so it's the backbone. What backbone is the pillar of the church. So actually, yeah. when I teach Jyotish, I always ask the you know, point of departure in looking at the chart is the Lagna, Lagna Lord. Right? Exactly. And what is, what is the overall condition and disposition? Because that is going to give you a clue to how these other uh, aspects of the chart. So favorable yogas will manifest less favorably if the Lagna Lagna Lord is not strong. And you look at Dhan Yogas and Raj Yogas in divisional charts as well, if the same planets are creating certain well, yoga in the well, mantra. But before you would do that, you would see if those um, uh, Raja Yogas continue to hold true from different Lagnas in the birth chart, meaning you know uh, the birth Lagna, the Chandra Lagna from the moon, and also Surya. Surya yeah. Take the Mahapurush Yogas, for example. Yeah. As, as you know, they're actually quite common in people's charts. Mm -hmm. But of course, you don't have all these great personalities walking around. Right. Um, it, just a good example for that is the the guy who kills John Lennon had four Mahapurush uh, Yogas in his chart. And I'm like, how can that? And well, when you, you go know, deeper... You'll look, you look in the chart of... Um, uh, what's his name? Helter Skelter... Um, oh, oh, oh Mer Charles, um, Charles Manson. Manson. Charles Manson, you know, he has a couple of these as well. Yeah. So, so um, you know, well, it did, it made them in, infamous people, but, you know, the those yogas have to be qualified in terms of, you know, do they repeat from the moon? Do they repeat from the sun? You know, with an exalted planet, it's so important to look at what's the dispositor doing, what's the landlord doing, what's its condition. Yeah. And, of course, you're bringing up the idea of, you know, seeing how those planets uh, bear out in important divisional charts, particularly in the Navamsha. Um, you know, has to be seen too. You know, Jodish is an incredibly complex sort of thing. Um, I, I like to use the phrase that, you know, very quickly you can look in, at a chart and start having the Mego experience. My eyes glaze over. <laughs> yeah, yeah. As you're, as you're trying to, you know, count to this. But if you just break it down and take it a step at a time, as I, you know, try to teach students to do, you know, it, it can be manageable that way. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of factors that affect whether a yoga is going to bring its. Um, you know, uh, promised effects or not. And of course, the real test of whether that is happening or not is do you see the effects in the life? Right. Exactly. <laughs> that's, 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 that's the ultimate. No, absolutely. You know, but now, if Donald, yeah. let, me, let me just use one more example. Sure. Um, 
Ravi Shankar, the great Indian musician, right? The musician, yeah, yeah. Yeah. He has, you know, these be this beautiful Saraswati yoga, which inclines one towards higher learning, classical, mm -hmm. uh, artistic, self-expression, all that sort of thing. You know, it's defined by uh, Jupiter, Venus, and Mercury mm -hmm. all being in angles, trines, or the second house, right? Yeah. So he has this beautiful exalted Venus, his, his Gemini Lagna, beautiful exalted Venus in the tenth. Jupiter, the, the dispositor, goes into the second house, also exalted, glancing, oh, man. Back, glancing back onto the tenth house. Wow. Mercury goes to the ninth house. You know, it has its own strength. I think it's in the sign of a great friend. But you see, this this repeats from Chandra Lagna as well. And there's no blemish of natural malefics on this configuration at all. And it's funny you say that because in my testing, even when I do testing in my emails, I see that the effects of Mahadasha is somehow more prominent from the moon than even the Lagna. And I'm like, wow, how is that possible? But it's like, it's happening. Kapil, you've discovered very, something very important that I think every student of Jyotish does. Yeah. I, started, I started seeing the same thing. Take the chart of Joseph Campbell, well, one of the sort of greatest scholars and scholars and philosophers, yeah. Philosophers and, you know, recognizable sort of professors of the age, right? Mm -hmm. um, I was just looking at his chart the other day. He's got like five planets in Pisces. Mm -hmm. um, if the birth time given is accurate, I think it is, it, they all fall in the seventh house. But if you see his moon in Cancer, very strong Chandra Lagna, all those planets fall in the ninth house. Yeah. You'd expect a very strong exactly. And that's a mistake I first made with Joseph Campbell chart because he has Saturn and Venus in the sixth house from from the ascendant, uh, and, and then from Chandra Lagna, they go into I believe the tenth house. Uh, that could be. I thought his Saturn was in Capricorn in the fifth house from Virgo, but you know I'm just going from memory here. So. Okay, but, but yeah, yeah. I but I see you the point that how point, important it, it is. And I always and you know talk about the Vimshotri Dasha. I always see it. From Chandra Lagna. Yeah, yeah. And, and very Lost. often, what I see happening is much clearer from that angle. Yeah, it's, it's so amazing that from the moon, everything just comes to light. Like, you know what? It's not really that. It is this. And when you test it, like, wow, from moon lagna is so important. Very important to see. You, you know, you can't. I wouldn't use it exclusively, and you can't discount. No, 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 no. Placement, but. If you don't take it into account, if you don't see it from that uh, point of view, you're likely to, to miss major indications. Yeah, exactly. Like if the moon, if a planet is in the second house, but then moves to the sixth house from the moon, you can say that hey, there's going to be some obstacles. There could be some accidents, especially if it's Venus, and you can have some injuries through car because it represents vehicles, and it does happen. It does take place in their life because Venus then goes into that the Shtana house. So you have to see it and synthesize both. No, yeah. No, no question. So even though they get the money, they get the inheritance and the family love, but at the same time, the accident is still there happening. You know. Sure. And you know that that's why divisional charts are so important. I like to make the point that say you're running the major period in Vimshotra of a planet, that planet's going to be in one house, and maybe it rules two houses, right? Yeah. Yeah. So you've got the things related to those houses, but how about you know, life is happening simultaneously in all areas of all areas of life. Exactly. Yeah. You know, their you know their their siblings are having experiences. They're having experiences with their children. Of course, they're having experience with it. So how do you sort that out? Just using the Vimshotri Dasha, and that's where Parashara's divisions come in. Because that in each of those divisions, that planet is going to have a placement. It's going to have a overall disposition. My favorite example of this, remember Rosh Nish, Osha? Osha Rosh Nish, oh yeah, my dad was a big follower of him. Okay, in his Jupiter-Venus period, he owned 79 Rolls Royces. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, quite a, an astonishing karma, right? Yeah. Now, you know, Prashara gives us the D16, the Shodashamsha division, right? Yeah. You show our karma with vehicles. Mm -hmm. If you look in his Shodashamsha, uh-huh. His Lagna of the Shodashansha has Jupiter exalted, and the fourth from there has Venus Swakshetra in its own sign. And it was, yeah. It was exactly in Jupiter, Venus, that he had all those Rolls Royces. Right? So you could see that that particular period and sub period, specific to that area of life, right? Yeah. He was going to have what might, some might consider 
you know, good karma. It sounds fairly excessive to me. I don't know why any man needs 79 Rolls Royces. Exactly. <laughs> but nonetheless, that was his karma, and that can't necessarily be seen in the birth chart at all, but it can be, you know, if you look at his show to Shamshi, it becomes clear. Exactly. And another trick I always tell people is that put the Mahadasha Lord in the ascendant and look for Antradasha results from that Mahadasha Lord. If you don't, you're not really using the vision. Exactly. Why should, you know, uh, think of Sylvester, Sylvester Stallone. Yeah. His whole rise in his whole rocky sort of periods happened in his Jupiter period. Mm -hmm. But it started in the Venus sub-period. Now, if you look at Venus from the, his, his birth log in the Sagittarius, it's with Saturn and Mercury in the 8th house Cancer. Mm -hmm. Okay. But now if you use the position of his Jupiter, the Mahadasha Lord, just like you're talking about, yeah. as a Lagna in Virgo, all those planets go in the 11th from there, forming substantial Raja and Dhani Yogas. Exactly. So this shows why. And then think of President Clinton. He got a president in his Jupiter period. Some period was Mercury. Use Jupiter and Libra as your Lagna. Now Mercury goes to the 10th with Saturn again, forming very good Raja Yoga. Absolutely, yeah. Well, we could go on here. I, could, I know. I can cite examples of that, but all beginning students, and I'll, I'll, I'll acknowledge that when I first started using the Vim Shodri Dasha, so often I was looking at events even in my own life, and I was scratching my head saying, I don't get it. I don't see how that event gets shown, right? Absolutely. I was running my Rahu period, and the moon is seventh from it, right? And I had this major relationship, but until I understood this concept, I didn't see why the moon sub-period was giving me relationship, right? Right. The answer was it was falling seventh from the Dasha Lord. From the Dasha Lord, you yeah. Used, you used the Rahu, the position of Rahu is the first house. And, of course, this is right out of the Brihat Parasha Horse Shastra. You go to that chapter dealing with the interpretation of Dasha, and over and over again, it's saying, you no, know, where is the sub-period Lord falling from the major period Lord? And I just noticed something, too, in your chart. You, your moon is then with Ketu. That means mind is becoming spiritual. Mind wants to get away from the material things, go on a spiritual thing. And if it's seventh from Rahu, it shows that you want to express that to other people. Well, that can be a part of it, you know, but you have to see it in Jaimini if you really want to understand the significance of it. Yeah. You know, you'll, you'd see that the moon is the highest um, degrees in my chart of any planet, so that makes it the Atmakar. Atmakar, yeah. And, of course, in that system, Ketu is the um, Mokshakarka. Mokshakarka, yeah. So, you know, at a very young age, you know, not that I've in any way gotten even close to achieving that, but in a very young age, I, in fact, I was in my early 20s when I first became aware of that com uh, concept, and, of course, I've been uh, on a spiritual path and, and strongly seeking since then. Um, and so, you know, go back to Kay and Rao's statement. If you really want to see um, the, the chart from a spiritual angle, you need to be able to understand Jamie because you have to use the Atmakar. Right? The ka yeah, you have to use the Karaka. This is the backbone of Jamie. Karka. You have to see its relationship to K2. You have to see its relationship to the PK the planet with the fifth highest degrees, yeah. and, so, and so many other things. If you look at K. and Rao's chart, for example, you'll see that he also has his Atmakaraka in the twelfth house with K2. Yeah. And, of course, if you read his book, Yogi's Death, Eat, and Will of Time, you can see that since his Jupiter period, his whole life has been about you know, a spiritual pathway and you know, looking to try to achieve spiritual liberation. Oh, absolutely. Now, um, I wanted to move to this other subject, which is, again, um, I wanted to discuss that with you, as I told you, um, is the subject of nakshatras. How important are, are the nakshatras, and, and not just the placement of the moon on the nakshatra, but a planet sitting in a different nakshatra, because certain planet is sitting in some padha, some nakshatra. What is your take and experience on dealing with nakshatras and planets and moon? Well, Kapil, let me answer. Let me answer this question this way. If you know, I told you I was a Western astrologer for 20 years. Mm -hmm. What really differentiates and distinguishes the Vedic system, the Jyotish, from Western astrology? The essence of it is yogas, mm -hmm. planetary combinations, yeah. which show what karma yeah. is going to be, you know, present and what dashas, which show when. Mm -hmm. And I would say another, the other feature that differentiates it and strongly distinguishes it is the nakshatras, right? Yes. So, which is actually a, a more ancient 
a division of the zodiac than yeah. the, or the, of the ecliptic. The original, I guess. The original. Yeah. And so there's so many uses of it. Now you know just to go with you know one basic use is that the placement of particular planets like the Lagna, the Moon, the degree of the Lagna itself are going to be to see their position by nakshatra gives one very strong clues as to you know certain predominant elements within the pers personality. Mm -hmm. Again, let's not just speak theoretically. Some people may be aware of the birth chart of former President Lyndon Johnson. He has like five planets in Leo. Okay, mm -hmm. three of those planets are in the nakshatra of uh, Magha, okay? including his uh, Lagna Lord Sun and Moon. Or, I'm sorry, the Lagna Lord uh, Sun, Mars, and Jupiter. Right. So you know what is what does Magha mean? It means the mighty, right? Mighty, yeah. It's the royal nakshatra. The symbol of it is obviously the throne. Mm -hmm. And if you know anything about Lyndon Johnson, he was one of the most autocratic Democrats who ever lived. Extremely dominating in his personality, mm -hmm. right? Extremely authoritarian. Yeah. And as I said, sort of very autocratic. So the fact that his Lagna Lord, you know, and the Sun and some other key planets like the Tenth Lord were in that nakshatra was very interpretively significant. Take the chart of Deepak Chopra, Aquarius Lagna. His Lagna Lord Saturn goes into Pushyami. Yeah. His own nakshatra, right? Mm -hmm. in the sixth house of the healing arts. Healing arts, yeah. And of course, one of the key meanings associated with Pushyami is that someone would earn their living through their knowledge, through Vidya. Of course, if you know anything about what Dr. Chopra's life is all oh, about. Oh, absolutely. I actually did his horoscope. <laughs> I'll share with you that the first consultation I ever had in Jyotish was from David Frawley, right? Wow. In the yeah. very early 90s, and he pointed out that the degree of my Lagna fell in Uttara Falguni. Uh, you know, and that one of the meanings associated with that was uh, people who uh, get inclined towards uh, the helping professions, wanting to, you know, be of service to others and to alleviate other suffering, which, you know, has been, uh, I've always been in those kinds of roles. At one time, I functioned as a psychotherapist, and I have a you know, my background is counseling psychology, and I've always right. been in roles where I've been in, you know, serving in that capacity. Even now, as I'm, you know, trying to help people through Jyotish. So um, that's one level of the nakshatras. Now, also, just to see subtle relationships, um, you all, you, everybody should be aware of Angelina Jolie, right? Oh yeah, very famous actress. Yep. You well, know, I've done a lot of research mm -hmm. on the charts of actors and actresses, and I wrote a big article about this, Hollywood Nights, but. You'll see strong connections between the third house, third lord of the dramatic arts, and the tenth house, tenth lord, if someone is actually a professional uh, actress or actor, right? Mm -hmm. So in her chart, um, you don't see a very obvious connection that way, but if you look at her third lord Mercury, it's in Megashera, Mars is nakshatra, and if you look at her tenth lord Mars, it's in Ravati, Mercury's nakshatra. So there is called a sukshma parivartana yoga. Yeah. It's, it's actually a very strong way in which two planets can be connected. Mm -hmm. And if you didn't see the nakshatra level of her chart, you would that would be completely lost on you. Amazingly enough, at the age of five, when she was running Mercury Mars, the period and sub period of those two planets, her third lord and, and uh, tenth lord connected, is when she made her first movie appearance as a child. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> See, I missed that that part. Yeah, that is amazing. No, if you don't mind, I'll just use my own chart too. Oh, absolutely. Go ahead. You know, you've seen my moon, okay? And I ran my moon period at a fairly young age, started at age 7 through age 17. Mm -hmm. Now, during that time, I was, you know, uh, in a very religious setting. I was born into a Catholic family. My parents sent me to Catholic schools where I was taught by nuns in grade school and then by priest in high school. Mm -hmm. I served as, as what's known as an altar boy where I'm up, you know, assisting the priest with the ritual of the mass. I yeah. was even what's called an altar boy officer, which means I served in the very, you know, high solemn masses which took place like on Christmas Easter. My point being is that there was this, I was surrounded by religion in my moon period. Now just looking at my moon, you and its placement in the chart and what it's connected to and what houses its Lord, you would never get that. But if you look on the level of nakshatra, you'll see that it falls in Venus's nakshatra. In Sagittarius. And then if you look at my Venus 
in the ninth house, the Lord of the ninth in the ninth, you'll see it falls in the moon's nakshatra. Mm -hmm. Again, uh, sukshma parivartana yoga. Right. Change on the subtle level. So actually, the moon is extremely connected to the ninth house and the ninth Lord, which is why religion was so prevalent in my life during that period. Do you see it? That's... So when we talk about the, when we talk about the use of nakshatras, it, the nakshatras have many uses, right? They all have interpretive significance. I never fail to see when a person is running a particular dasha which nakshatra it falls in. That's going to have. You mean like uh, if Jupiter, if they're running through Saturn dasha, you look which, what which, nakshatra which, Saturn which is. Which period are you running now, Kapil, yourself? Which period? I am running Jupiter. What degree is Jupiter? Twelve degrees, twelve point five. Well, in, in Maga. It, it's in Leo? In, yeah. Ma Maga. Right? Maga. Well, you were correctly named with the last name Laraj, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but one of, the, one of the things I would suggest... And do you know since birth I've been running the Mahadasha of Maga? <laughs> and since birth my name has been Raj. It was never Shervastava, which is my original last name. So, you know, I would see this, if I was looking at your chart, I would say, well, you're going to be prominent at this time in some way. You're going to become something of a star, right? <laughs> yeah. you're, going, you're going to have a certain level of, you know, celebrity. Yeah. <laughs> now, potentially, I'd have to see Jupiter and what yogas it might be involved in, and there would be so many things else you'd want to consider. You may actually just have the desire for that. Yeah, the thing well, what I have prominent is the Dharma Karma the Pati Yoga. Okay, there you have. Then the ninth Lord are conjoined. Yeah, then, then, then it would be assured, right? Yeah. But going back to what you know, sometimes when people have these, I distinguish between having the structure of the yoga in your chart, mm -hmm. right, and then having enough juice behind it to actually give you the effect. Think about, think about having a bank account, right? You yeah. have a, you have a mechanism for withdrawing money. But if there's no money in the bank, there's nothing to draw on. Exactly. Right? Just having the structure of the yoga in your chart is just the start. It's like having the bank account. Mm -hmm. But if there's nothing in there or very little in there, the person's just going to dream about it. Exactly. It's the, you know they really don't have that karma. Now, of course, who creates the karma? You know, sometimes I think, you know, with Jyotish we can start seeing everything as being entirely predetermined, but of course, how did the chart get created? And how do we go on becoming, you know, a pure creative intelligence that then creates for ourselves whatever experience that we focus on? Absolutely. And of course, you know, all the Shastra tells us that, you know, ultimately we can completely transcend our karmas and that what we really are, are pure creative intelligence, pure consciousness, that is beyond time and space, and that if we can come to realize that we are that, then we're off the wheel of samsara, we're off the wheel of death and rebirth, we're out of karma, and charts have no relevance. Absolutely. Now, let's say if a student was to ask you this, that, Guruji, if my Saturn is in this sign, do I give my Saturn the personality of the sign, or mainly the personality of the nakshatra? Well, first of all, I would never let any student of mine call me Guruji. <laughs> oh, come on. You are. I mean, this has been the most profound interview for me. You went into Shastiyamsha chart to, you know, all teacher. the examples. Of this is the greatest I'm a, moment. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a teacher. I'm no, I'm no one's guru. But to answer your question, yeah. it's, it's always a synthesis. It's always, and what I mean is, is that, yes, of course you're looking at the sign that it's in. Mm -hmm. But you're also looking at the next chakra. Again, let, let me use a concrete example. Of course, we have the movable signs, right? Yeah. And then we have, which have to do with, you know, having movement, being a lot of movement in your life. A lot of ideas. Yeah, and then, of course, you've got the ninth house, which is long-distance travel. Mm -hmm. And then you have Jupiter, which is the planet of long-distance travel. When Deepak Chopra ran his Jupiter period in the ninth house, in a movable Rashi, Libra, Mm -hmm. He was constantly flying all over the world. Yeah. You know, b being a teacher, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And then you see the particular nakshatra that it was that it was in as well. So each of those are, are going to have, and of course, it determines the dignity to some degree. Every every you know planet being assigned is going to turn. So there's multiple uses interpretively 
of both the sign that a planet is in, but you can, should not ever fail to see the nakshatra is in. And as I think I've heard you talk about with others, the, um, the, the lord of the nakshatra that the dasha lord is in mm -hmm. gives some very important interpretive clues as to what that dasha is going to bring. Right, right. What's your take on that? Well, well, first of all, it's not a principle, by the way, that I learned okay. from him well. Right. I'm not sure I actually have even ever heard him refer to that. But it's one that I did learn, I believe it was from heart to foe. And um, I started researching that and, and you know, sort of, I, I know when I hear something or I read something, I never sort of believe it or, or disbelieve it. I, I tuck it away and then look for an opportunity to test it. And so I have found this to be a very reliable interpretive principle. And um, you know, I'll share with you, I recently moved into my Saturn period. I made some predictions about it myself. You have fun doing this, right? Yeah. You, you move into a new dash and you think about what the various things it could mean. And of course, you know, it's, it's a, probably a fool of an astrologer who predicts for himself. But yeah. why, not? Why, why not? It's fun, right? Yeah. So I saw that I was moving into my Saturn period. It's in the nakshatra of the sun, which for me is the 12th lord. It happens to be an exalted 12th lord in my 8th house. And so I'm thinking about this, and I'm going, and in the fifth, uh, the Saturn rules my fifth house, which I'm not going to be having any children, but you know I am teaching Jody, so I have students, right? Yeah. So I'm thinking to myself, gosh, in this in this Saturn period, it, it seems likely that I'll have foreign students, twelfth house, and actually probably teach in foreign countries. So you know, without my really even wanting to have it happen or to try to have it happen, since I then I've I've taught in Delhi, okay, foreign students. And as a result of that, I got an invitation to teach with Kay and Rao in Russia, which happened in, in, in Russia this last summer. Unfortunately, Kay and Rao could not make it because mm -hmm. of the role. Deepak, Deepak Basario, who you interviewed on here, yeah. it was he and I who taught there. Oh, um, wow. So, you, yeah, that's right. You must know him very closely then. Oh, yes. No, no. I, yeah. I think, uh, hey, wonderful man. Wonderful man. Very, wow. very, oh, yeah. Very knowledgeable joke. Very here. sweet man. Have a lot of respect for him, but we spent a lot of time together in Sochi recently, Russia. And then, you know, I have invitations now as a result of that to teach in other parts of Eastern Europe. And I'm scheduled to go back to India in October to teach and scheduled to go back to uh, uh, Russia next May. So the point I'm making is that Saturn is bringing a lot of foreign experience. Foreign experience, yeah. And the way that can be seen is that it's in the nakshatra of the 12th Lord. Mm -hmm. if, I, if I didn't see that, yeah, I, I would miss some of the um, likely results of this particular dash. Absolutely! Wow, this was just amazing. My God, this is like one of the best interviews you know that I've done. This is amazing. <laughs> um, one last question that I do want to ask you, a very I'm important question, so. is that if somebody wants to get a consultation from you and learn from you, Jyotish, where, how can they contact you, and where can they go? Well, thank you for asking. I, I you know, um, I recently retired from corporate life, and I am do now for the first time in my life doing this full time. I used to be more of an academic Georgian, uh -huh. but I have now have a website, www.markboney.com. Okay. And uh, soon through that website, I will be doing live streaming classes. Um, if someone wants to study with me now, and I'm actually more interested in teaching than I am consulting, although I do consult, okay. I, I've written like 50 articles, Kapil. And um, uh, you know some of them you may have seen on Von Paul's website. Yes, yes, of course. And but now I'm now um, distributing these myself. Uh, they're actually available through Amazon.com. Six of them at this point. I'm going to get all 50 on there uh, eventually here. But for right now, I just have six on there, and they'll be available also through my website soon. So uh, if someone wants to study with me, and I really enjoy teaching, it could be through classes I'll be organizing on the web here soon. That's still to come. But then also uh, people tell me they find my articles to be good, you know, instructional uh, tools as well. And of course, by reading Kay and, Kay and Rao's articles and books is the way I learned an enormous amount myself. Right. I'm reading it myself. But also, um, do you have a book that you want to tell people about if you have written any book on Joe? I have written actually three books. They're uh, not published yet, but they okay. will, be, will be published soon. I've written a book on the use of the divisional charts. Okay. Um, and I've written a, uh, a book called The Essentials of Jaimini. You know, there's so much being taught about Jaimini out there. I candidly confess that I teach and uh, use Jaimini in the K and Ra method. 
which is uh, uh, different and divergent from a lot of what is being taught with regard to the Jaimini out there. Uh huh. Okay. So, but I, you know, it, 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 people, I tell people that if you want to learn K and Rao's methods, that's what I teach, and they've they've served exactly. me, they've they've served me very well, um, and because um, what I always appreciated about him, Kapil, he never taught anything that he hadn't tested on hundreds of horoscopes. Yes, and that course, is. That's the research approach they take at the school. Exactly. And I can say that nothing that he's ever taught me has ever gone, has ever not been true. Of right. course, any interpretive principle in Jyotish gets modified under certain conditions. Now, you know, since you just said that, do you also believe, and this is, you can answer it quick, I don't want to take too much of your time, but how much involvement of intuition and psychic power is there when Vedic astrology or any kind of predictive astrology is involved? First of all, computer, you've got me talking about my favorite subject, so don't worry about time. Okay, okay. <laughs> and, and that's a very important question. You read his book, Interpreting the Vinchotri Dasha, right? Yeah, yes. And he talks about the several stages of the prediction. The last stage I think he refers to as seeing, right? Now, there's no question yes. that, you know, Intuition comes into play to get it exactly right, but I, I like to tell this story. Okay, yeah. there's, there's three Jodishi sitting around, and they're looking at a chart of a woman, and one Jodishi says to the other two, "Ah, this woman, husband's her husband died." And the second Jodishi looks at the other two and he says, "No, you're wrong. This woman's husband divorced her. She left her." And they're waiting for the third person who's just kind of, you know, not saying anything. And they finally say, well, what do you think? And he says, well, quite frankly, I think you're both wrong. This woman lost her Mangala Sutra, her marriage thread, and needed to be remarried. Now, it turns out he's the one that was correct. Now, what's, now what's going on here? All three are very competent Jodishis. They're seeing a configuration related to the eighth house. Mm -hmm. And they're drawing inferences. They're drawing sound astrological conclusions. And the first two conclusions that the first two Jodices drew were actually good inferences. They didn't happen to be right, yeah. but they were sound in terms of an astrological analysis. Only the third Jodice was correct because he had correct seeing. So I'll, I'll link that to a story that when I went to uh, K. N. Rao to be with him in India, because he wasn't coming to the U.S., at one point he said, Mark, you don't need to learn any more technical uh, things about Jyotish. You're already very technically sound. What you need to do is spiritual practice. Because only through spiritual practice are you going to develop that, um, that sight, you know, that intuitive Interesting. That, yeah. thing that allows you to pick out amongst all the different things that a particular combination could mean, which ones it's going to mean, which is the ability that he has. And so, and, and so he said, let's not talk any more Jodish. Let me take you on pilgrimage. Let's go visit sacred sites like Vrindavan, the birthplace of Krishna. Let's go worship the temples because this is what you need now. And that's, he, is that one of the methods like um, to increase your intuition power is to meditate, go at religious places, vortex places? So he took me to see a, uh, a Brigo reader. Uh -huh. And you know, one of those people that supposedly has your destiny written down, right? Yeah. And uh, it came out in that consultation that I should do something called Aditya Hridaya Stotra in order to uh, increase my astrological sight and ability. It's from the Ramayana. Okay. It's what's taught by Sage Agastya to Ram just before he's about to face Ravana. And essentially, it's a hymn to the sun. Of course, the sun rules sight and perception, right? Yes. And so he said, you know, this is what I need to do in order to develop as a Jyotishi to be able to have correct seeing. And so now every morning in my home temple, I do a recitation of Aditya Hridayam. So this is what Mr. Rao means when you're saying you need, you need to do sadhana, you need to do practice. Because, you know, he also likes to say, the divine will is never going to see let you see what he, they don't want, he doesn't or he or she doesn't want you to see. In other words, I, you know, I, I like to say Kapil that astrologers predict and God laughs. Yeah, 
Exactly. That, that's one of my favorite Absolutely. Things. Now, is there? Uh, I, I, it's from this. I have just got one more question. If you can ask, if you can answer it quickly. Um, well, I'm not good at short answers, but go ahead. Okay, okay, no, no, that's good. I just don't want to like take your time if you have to go somewhere. But my last question was the question of remedy. There are so many things in remedies, especially the major being the business of gemstones, then mantras, donations, then there's this lal kitab remedies. What have you learned, and what do you prescribe as a remedy, or do you even prescribe remedies in Jyotish? Again, I only follow K. and Rao's example. Yeah. I'll never forget, you know, when I asked him this question myself, he said, the two best remedies are, number one, any form of sincere worship. Any form. He doesn't tell a, a long-time practicing Catholic to do Vishnu Sahasrana. Right. You know, he says, go pray the rosary in your favorite church, right? So any, any form of sincere worship, of course, his favorite form and most recommended form of sincere worship is the, you know, chanting the thousand names of the Lord, Vishnu Sahasranam. If you go to visit him, you'll have to sit down and do that with him. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. Which, which is a wonderful thing. And then the other thing he said is help a needy person. Now, that help doesn't that necessarily mean you make a monetary donation to them. You know, it could be helping them in any way that might be useful. And so those are the two things that he most recommended, that he saw being effective, and of course, you know, here's the, the thing that I recommend too. I want to tell you a quick story because it's a fun story. I'm sitting there, sure. I'm sitting there with him in India, right? And so all day long, people are coming by. You know, they don't even make an appointment. That's not how he works. They just come by if he's available. If not, they wait. Yeah. So one time, this um, the beautiful young lady and her mother came by, and of course, I didn't understand Hindi, so I didn't know what they were saying. But I got it made it out that he, they were inviting him to something. And, you know, he was just sort of politely refusing. Afterwards, I asked him about it, and he said, yes, that woman and her mother had come to him six months ago. She had some rare and unexplained skin disease that was making her skin all blotchy, and uh, there were no suitors for her hand in marriage. She was at a very marriageable age, and it was preventing her from having any marriage arrangements. Now, she was running her mercury period, which was quite afflicted, and you may know that mercury rules the skin. Right? Yeah, yeah. So, of course, Mercury relates to, in terms of the Vedic uh, deities, uh, it relates to Vishnu. So he said, you must sit down and do the Vishnu Sahasranam daily, intensely, every day. That was the remedy he prescribed. Wow. Now, she had been to the best doctors. The family was affluent. They had taken her to the US. US no one, no dermatologist, no doctor had an explanation for this. But then she started doing the remedy that Kay and Rao advised. And of course, as the story goes, I wouldn't be telling you the story if it wouldn't even come yeah. out. But in a, in a brief period of time, the, the condition just mysteriously disappeared the way it had mysteriously manifested. And of course, there were suitors for her hand in marriage. She was engaged, and they'd come back to invite Kay and Rao to the wedding. Oh, wow. OK, so that was. He has hundreds of stories of these. Like that. Oh, yeah. I have my own stories to tell. And of course, you never, with an upaye, um, uh, you never know cause and effect because you don't know what would have happened if they didn't do it. Exactly. Exactly. So the, the evidence is always going to be anecdotal. But if you see enough of this, well, then you begin to believe. Absolutely. I don't that believe is. in gemstones at all. Anybody who thinks they're going to change their karma just by putting on a gemstone, in my opinion, is being very naive. Exactly. That is, thank you for saying that. They're going, they're going to be, you know, women love them. They love yeah. them to prescribe them. And if it makes them feel good putting on that gemstone. Oh, yeah. It's good as an accessory even for guys. You know, put it on if you like the blue sapphire. But I don't think that it's going to have some effect on your... Destiny, you know? I, you know. I didn't mean to make a sexist comment. Men like yeah. that, but I noticed that women in particular love. Yeah, exactly. Them. Love the idea of gemstones, but no, you know, it's not something I recommend. Um, I think doing the thing that I recommend is the mantras. Mantras, yeah. Ma mantra japam sadhana. That is a spiritual practice involving the use of mantra. That's what I use for myself. That's what I recommend for others. That's what I believe in. That's exactly. The only that's the only way I can answer that question. No, absolutely, because there's only one remedy that I always prescribe to anybody, no matter what problem. Like, go to a temple, pour milk on a shivling, 
because that's what I have done for the past three years. My not my life changed, and that's it. That's all you have to do. So that's you know something that the easiest mm -hmm. remedy in the love world. Be beautiful, Kabil. I'm really delighted to hear that. You know, Saturn has such a bad reputation in, in astrology, right? Yeah, yeah. And you know, I love the story you can find it on the internet about how um, Hanuman worship, right? Hanuman bhakti is the mm -hmm. best antidote to Saturn, right? Yeah. Yes. And, and there's a wonderful little myth about that. You know, so um, I'm in my Saturn period. I'm chanting the Hanuman Chalisa, you know, on, on a daily basis. And I believe it's brought... And look at that. Here you are in front of thousands of people. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> well, Juan Paul Manley is probably as much responsible for that as Hanuman. But I'll, I'll... He was the Hanuman who came. <laughs> <laughs> Without the tail, but... <laughs> he, does, he, does, he does Hanuman Bhakti uh, as well. And oh yeah. I also, I also like the joke that we're all just, uh, you know, monkeys in clothes anyway. Exactly. That's it. We're all Hanumans ourselves. Well, this has been fun. Kapoor. Absolutely, sir. Um, just a reminder to everybody that his website is markboney.com. So if you want to learn Vedic astrology from him and perhaps even get lucky to get a consultation from him, he's now, you know, teaching Vedic astrology. So please go there and check out his website. And I hope to have you again one more time because this is, was a delight, pure delight. I didn't even see the time, how quickly it passed by. But thank you so much, sir. The, the pleasure's been mine, Camille, and if you'd like to do it again, that would be wonderful. Absolutely. Thank you, sir. Namaste. Namaste to you.